This video is a grab bag of 10 distinct tips. Now, none of these tips quite warranted their own video, but I wanted to make sure I mentioned them somewhere in the course, and so here they are. Let's start off with our first example, and I'm gonna start off in the specs. So in this app, we have posts, and posts have a method on them to display them on a featured page. And if the post is fresh and there's a low spam risk, then we'll actually update the feature flag. But if the post is not fresh, or if the, the user is a high spam risk, we don't update the feature flag. Let's run these to get them queued up. We are starting off green. Let's go to our post. And here's that method I just talked about. Now this conditional is a compound conditional. We have created at less than 10 days ago and and user has confirmed email. I virtually always extract compound conditionals like this into private methods. I think it almost always makes the code better. So let's do that now. So right away, I actually think this code has improved. And the thing I like about this code is that it is now explicit about something that used to be implicit. So before we had this compound conditional, which represented whether or not the post was a good candidate for featuring. And if I had to read this full conditional, I would have to think about why is this there? But now I have this nicely named method that says why we're checking both these attributes. I think whenever you can take something in your code that is implicit, that becomes, that's part of your knowledge or something you would have to ask a teammate and make it more explicit with a good name, that's a big win. But there's no reason to stop here. I'd actually like to keep going and continue to make implicit things more explicit. And I'm going to start by looking at the first side of this conditional, which is created at less than 10 days ago. And what I'm really saying here is that the post is not too old to feature. So let's extract another method. Cool, nice little improvement. And this other side here, we're asking if the user has a confirmed email. That's not very clear. The reason that we're checking if the user has a confirmed email is because we wanna make sure that this post is unlikely to be spam. So again, why don't we encode that in a better way? Cool. Now look how nicely our class is reading. If this is a good candidate for featuring, then feature it. If you care more about what it makes a good candidate for featuring, you can look here. And if you care more about any of those details about what makes something too old or what makes something a low spam risk, you can look further down in the class. Also notice that all our methods are nice and short and small. I love working with classes and systems that are composed of little tiny methods. My favorite methods look like this. They take no parameters and they're just one line. Now chances are, if I were doing this refactoring on a real system, I would probably stop here. But what if the code already looked like this and I was about to add another condition here, something like this. At this point, this is starting to look like a lot of logic to live right in the post model. And so I would probably do something like extract a policy object. So that might look like this. And then I would copy over this not too old method and this low spam risk method into this new class that we just created. I would need to do a little more work here, but I think you can see the direction I'm going. Now we have this policy object whose responsibility is to answer when a post is a good candidate for being featured. This is the more involved refactoring that I reach for when my conditionals end up with not just two branches, but three branches. By extracting this policy object, testing gets a lot easier, and it's nice to have all of the logic for determining when a post should be featured in one place. It also lets me clear out these very specific private methods out of post and put them in a new class. While I was refactoring, I would probably leave this featureable post in here. I would probably leave this class here uh, private in the post. Eventually, I would make this policy public and write unit tests for it. So quick review, when you have compound conditionals, extract them into private methods. When you have implicit things, try to make them explicit. And if your conditionals continue to get hairy, consider something like a policy object. Tip number two is to have a bin setup script. 
This is something that I create in all of my Rails applications. And the job of the bin setup script is to get a new Rails app up and running. It, and you can see here the idea is to run it immediately after you clone the code base. Your bin setup script can start with this. Feel free to copy these things. Very basic things here like copying over the sample env, getting the gems installed, making sure everything looks good, setting up the database, and then this task, which I'll talk about more in a second, uh, adding some Heroku remotes, whatever. This can be totally specific for your setup. The idea is any of the annoying things you have to do to get running, throw them in here rather than a readme, for example. It's much nicer to just be able to run a script than have to walk through steps in a readme. One thing you're likely to experience if you do create a bin setup script is that your app will migrate over time and the bin setup script will stop working, but you won't notice it right away. So when a new person joins your team or you set up the app on a new machine, watch out for breakage here and get it fixed. I don't think it's quite worth writing tests for this script, which means it, it will break over time, but it's still worth having. So I said I would come back to this right here. I like to also create a rake task for creating development seed data. Let's look at an example of that. Here's the task. First thing to notice is that this task is only available in development and staging. That's a nice idea for tasks that blow away the whole database and fill it with new things. This will save you from shooting yourself in the foot. You'll see there's another guard inside the actual uh, task here that I'll show you in a second. And here is what your data creator might look like. Again, we're protecting ourselves from foot shooting. And then we have one high level method called run that creates all of the data that we might want in our application to do useful development. Just like the bin setup script, instead of giving people instructions to run in a readme that says, hey, also create a user, create some teams, create some plans, create whatever, just have a script that does it all. I sometimes do write tests for tasks like this because like the bin setup script, they are likely to break over time if they're not tested. There is one tension though, where it's often nice to have your development data creator create something like hundreds of entries and that can be very slow to run every time you run your tests. So there's a trade-off to balance. Tip number four is to watch out for comments. Now, I think most people know the standard advice on comments, which is if you have code that feels like it needs a comment, see if you can improve the code until the comment becomes unnecessary. For instance, I will often make my code verbose, give it very verbose and long names that sort of explain why I'm doing something weird if I felt like I needed a comment. But there's a particular kind of comment that I think people consider an exception and creeps in even into good applications, and that is the to-do comment. Here's an example right here that I took from a random open source project. This is actually a twofer. Number one, we have a commented out test. Don't leave commented out code in your apps, and especially don't leave commented out tests. If you feel the need to comment out a test, just delete it. If you feel the need to comment out some code, just delete it. Git has it. If you ever need it, you can get it back. Just blow it away. This is like leaving trash in your kitchen. But coming back to this to-do comment, to-dos don't belong in code, in my opinion. To-dos belong in whatever your issue management system is. I don't think there's anyone in the world that gets in on Monday morning and says, I'm going to knock out some of the random to-dos scattered throughout our app. If a to-do is important, you should promote it into a GitHub issue or a Trello card or whatever you use to manage your work, and that way it can be prioritized and not forgotten. And just to back up my point a little bit on this, the history of this to-do, it has been here for over a year in this application, untouched. To-dos just hang around, delete them, or promote them into real issues. That said, I think there is one kind of comment that's all right. I took this from the Discourse project. This, I think, is not a terrible comment. It's talking about how the fact that, yes, something weird is happening right here, but it's much more efficient than active records, so leave it alone. This part is performance critical. I think it would be a little tricky to get this comment into the code, although I might do something like this. Not sure, though. I might just leave this comment as is. Tip number five is to organize the methods in your class in descending order of abstraction. That looks like this. This is a class for making hard-boiled eggs. And if you want to make hard-boiled eggs, you prepare the pot, you add the eggs, and then you wait until they're cooked. Notice how all three method calls here are at a very high level of abstraction. That is what I'm always shooting for in my public methods. I want someone to be able to open a class and get a super high level overview of how the class works. Now, if I want or need to, I can dive down into a deeper level of abstraction, and that's all hidden behind this private keyword. But let's look, we have prepare pot. And so the way you prepare a pot is you locate it, you fill it, and then you place it on the stove. Notice, 
even though we've descended below the private keyword, we are still doing a high level description of a slightly lower level step. So I've descended a level of abstraction from what's up here, but I'm still trying to keep it fairly high level. Let's scroll down a little further. Here we've dropped down another level of abstraction to locating the pot, filling it with water and placing it on the stove. And at the very bottom, we get down to the nitty gritty of something like is pot like. Let's jump back up to the top of the class. Notice how this reads. High level three steps. This is the first step. This is the second step. This is the third step. See, prepare, add eggs, wait until cooked. Prepare, add eggs, wait until cooked. Then I dive down into prepare pots methods. Locate pot, fill pot with water, place pot on stove. And then if there were methods in add eggs and wait until cooked, they would appear beneath these. The level of abstraction of my methods moves smoothly from high to low as you read down the class. This is great because if you don't care about the details, you can stay at the top. And as you need to get more into the nitty gritty, you just keep scrolling. Imagine I ignored this and moved this is pot like method to the top. Do you see how out of place this looks now? We've gone from super high level and then we go below the private keyword and all of a sudden we're talking about responds to and size and things like that. We've lost that nice consistency that this class used to have. I'm going to undo that. Something to notice about this. It can be tricky to know where to put a method at what level of abstraction. This is especially hard as your class gets more methods. And my answer to that is don't put more methods in your classes. If you're having a hard time organizing the methods in your class by level of abstraction, there are probably too many methods in your class. One final nice benefit here, notice that I could basically draw a line at any point and extract everything below that point into a new object and have it make sense. That's pretty awesome. I could at any point decide that there's too much going on in this class and extract things. I could even extract each of these methods into their own object and the class would still make sense. There's very little I would have to rearrange. This will give me a nice clean diff when I open up a pull request. Tip number six is to understand how the tap method works. I'm going to open up some specs first and run these. Don't worry about this quite yet. Let's just hop over here. Okay. Super simple example. We are taking a user, updating some attributes, calling save, and then returning that user. Now we can't just remove this line because user.save returns true as opposed to the user. So we need to explicitly return the at user here. One little micro optimization you can make is to use the tap method. Still works. Tap takes whatever object you call it on and passes it in as a parameter to the block and then returns it. So this at user becomes just this local block user. We can mutate it and then save it. And at the end, tap evaluates to the value of user. Just a small tip, but sometimes very handy. Notice that I never reached for the return keyword. That's because I like to rely on the fact that Ruby will automatically return the last thing that was evaluated in a method. However, there is one place I do like return, and that is in early returns. Here's another example pulled from discourse, which is right here, this guard clause. So if you want to see if someone has posted too much in a topic, we have some work to do. However, we don't want to apply that to staff and non-new members, so we can bail out early here. I actually like having guard clauses like this at the start of my method because it makes it easy to ignore the rest of the method if this thing applies. Notice that if this code didn't use this one liner in this way, we would need to do something like this. This isn't too bad, but imagine needing to add another condition where this doesn't apply. Suddenly we have another nesting here. This is getting uglier and uglier. However, if we stick with this guard clause approach, we can just keep adding conditions without indenting the rest of the code. I'm pretty into this. Tip number seven is to prefer the exception raising variance over silent failing. So this user class has a deactivate method on it where we set the active flag to false and then save it and then email the user a deactivation notice. But the thing to notice is that save here could totally fail and if it failed, it would just return false. That false will get discarded. And then we, we would incorrectly email the user a deactivation notice. That's why I'd prefer to do things like save bang. If this thing fails when it shouldn't, I want to know about it. I tend to prefer my failures to be noisy rather than silent. Because of this, I prefer the save bang method, update bang method, create bang method, etc. Whenever I can have an exception appear as opposed to failing silently, I'm into that. 
Tip number nine is don't use a control couple. So what does a control couple look like? A control couple is something you pass into a method to tell it which branch to take. So here's some code where a comment has a post method and you can pass a flag about notifying admins. So if I just call comment.post, it will notify the admins. And if I pass this false Boolean in, it won't notify the admins. This parameter here, should notify admin, is called a control couple. And it's called a control couple because the code here is more coupled to the method it's calling than it needs to be. Specifically, the code here calling comment.post and passing false knows what it wants to happen rather than just relying on post to do the right thing. The code calling comment.post and passing false knows it doesn't want to notify admins, and it knows that there's a conditional inside that looks at the parameter it passes in. A better way would be to have two methods. This one notifies admins, and this one doesn't. Since the calling code already knows what path it wants, it should just have the option to call a method that takes that path, rather than controlling the execution with a boolean. Notice that both of these method calls don't have a parameter. The parameter coupling is gone. That means this code is a bit better than it used to be. Now we can change the inside of post and the inside of post without notifying admins without changing the calling code. But up here, if we want to change the method by which we specify that admins shouldn't be notified, the calling code needs to change and the code that's being called needs to change at the same time. That coupling is high. We don't like it. This is a better approach. One example from real life, it used to be that you could call save false in Rails to skip validations. Later, the team decided that they wanted to have it look like this. They wanted to pass a hash as opposed to a single boolean because they wanted to be able to pass additional options into save. Also because save false is not very obviously clear what's happening. When they made the change from save false to save validate false, all of our client code had to change. Everywhere you were calling save false, you now needed to change that parameter. That was the cost of the coupling introduced by this Boolean parameter here. Now imagine it had instead been save and save without validation. Now Rails can change the contents of those methods all they want, change all the internals as much as they want, and none of the client code has to change. That is the benefit of lower coupling. My final tip, tip number 10, is to not use instance variables in partials. Every so often, I like to grep my Rails app for violations of this. Here I'm using AG, known as the Silver Searcher, which is a faster grep replacement. And I'm looking for the at symbol in any file in the views directory that starts with an underscore. Looks like I do have a violation in this app. And it looks like this. I'm in the underscore form partial, and I am referencing at user. Now you don't want to reference instance variables in your partials because it couples the partial to that particular controller that sets up that instance variable. You want to be able to reuse this partial wherever you want to display its contents without worrying about what controller rendered the view originally. Fortunately, the fix for this is quite simple. I'll go to where I'm calling this partial, which is right here, and I'll change it to look like this. Now I'm passing in the at user as a user local. Going back to my partial, I can just reference a normal user like this. And again, we picked up a nice win. This partial is now agnostic about where users come from, which means I'm more likely to be able to use it from other places and not worry about what controller set up the user variable originally. So that's it. That's my 10 tips. I hope it was useful, and I'll see you next time.